When you get to the close-up stuff, it's right there in your hands. Close-up magic has this tremendous immediacy that stage magic doesn't have. It's the impossible being done a few feet away from you. The idea of being able to have magical powers is a very intoxicating idea. forms of magic. Close-up is the oldest, the simplest, and the purest. At its heart, there are tricks that have hardly changed for thousands of years. What's fascinating about magic is you go in there and say, I'm going to lie to you, and then you do. And you say, look at this carefully, try to bust me, and they can't. You can check the sleeves, you can check the pockets, you can check everything. Is that fair? Yeah. Is that fair? No, good, excellent. Magic is not about tricks. Restaurants are not about food. Magic is about people. People still want that kind of real element, you know, so that doesn't involve technology, but involves humanity. It's a one-to-one. -one. It's people communicating with other people. Oh, my God! Oh, awesome. And there's nothing quite like seeing something that is impossible under your nose for real. These tickets are useless. At the moment, OK? I mean, it's not the National Lottery, I'll give you that, it really isn't, you know? The essential simplicity of close-up magic means it can be performed anywhere. Did you get searched by security? Yes. yes. Yeah, so did I, but I managed to sneak this through, right? Check this out. Have a guess what's in there, have a feel of that. You'll never guess. No? All right, have a look. So this is really weird. What I did, this is a great way of kind of sneaking stuff past security if, if you get stuck, right? You'll never guess what's in here, look. <laughs> Close-up involves people being right here, people being able to reach out, pick something up, let me put this into your hand. Oh, maybe I can borrow this from you. We need an empty bottle. We need a 50p. Got 50p? 50p. Thank you. Hey, hold the bottle like that. Hold the like that, like that, like that. Good, excellent, excellent, excellent. No, just, just, you, you've got a wrist, that's all right, fine. <laughs> when you actually do something close up, there's no escape route for people. They have to confront the fact that they have seen it with normal objects that they've been able to touch and examine themselves. They've seen things close up, they couldn't get any, any closer to it. And yet, if you still succeed in fooling them under those circumstances, that obviously has a tremendous impact. The roots of close-up magic are as old as man himself. But the earliest reliable description comes from the street markets of ancient Rome, where Seneca, the philosopher and writer, described how he watched a magician performing sleight of hand tricks. You're all placing your money on this yeah, one here, you're all placing your money on this one here. And the trick Seneca described, it was a very common one, performed in the streets of all ancient cities and across all cultures. The cups and balls routine. Magic is, in many ways, its own language, and it's a way of communicating with people, and that does reach across cultures. Uh, 
a lot of the methods and the concepts and the basic things that you do with these things are unchanged in the last hundreds of years. The cups and balls, I think, must be the most representative trick in the whole arcana of magic because it simply combines virtually every effect that is possible to achieve by conjuring. There is penetration of one cup by another and sometimes by the wand. There's transposition when a ball vanishes here and reappears over there. He can change its form, he can change its colour. To have all that on a tabletop can be quite beautiful. The cups and balls, though, became for magicians uh, a classic in the sense that you would want to climb that mountain as a magician. One, two, gone. Gone. Arrived. All of this is, of course, totally impossible. The cups and balls became a kind of a rite of passage uh, to signify your, your dedication because it embodies so many different techniques that you have to master in order to be able to perform a full routine with the cups and balls. I'm going to do this very slowly this time. And so the very cups slowly. and balls has always been a benchmark by which magicians measure their skills. And each has sought to give it his own special flavour. If the ball's in my left hand, it's in my left hand. If it's not in my hand, it's under the cup. If it's under the cup, it's not in my hand at all. If it's in that hand, it could be in that. If it's in that, it could be up there. If it's up there, it could be down there. If it's in the pocket at the same time, it could be up there at the same time. It's under the cup. If the cup and the ball together, they can't be separate. If they can't be together, if it's up there at the same time. Now, if the cup and the ball are together and the cup is empty, you can't have the ball. You've got the ball in the cup, you can't be in the pocket. In the pocket, you can't be in the cup at the same time, it's under the cup. If, on the other hand, the ball and the cup are together, then the cup. Not... You're not following this, are you? <laughs> so here's our version of the cups and balls. If I were going to explain to someone, what Penn and Teller do. Uh, uh, the example I would use is the cups and balls. Hey, the first ball, hit hand the first cup, and the second ball simultaneously screwed it beneath the cup. But There's never right. been yeah, people who did four-handed stuff. We fooled everybody just because we were doing a standard pass, but between two people, you know, just that kind of thing. Now all seven second out, three cups, all loaded, three balls on top. Center ball, please, center cup, these are the side balls, you put away anymore, we have three to center cup. You think of one geek practicing in front of a mirror forever doing this, you don't think of two geeks practicing it together. These three balls that come over here, and this is not juggling, this is called misdirection, for looking over here, tell us takes the final ball under, there's one more on either side, and of course, Mr. Barney Lime for our finish. And with the clear cups, it just becomes this wonderful kind of, uh, there's an honesty and there's a uh, there's a humility. The ball shoots up your sleeve. It doesn't. It does. And you roll it across your shoulders and you bring it down this side, which is why you have to put the cup down very quickly like this, down quickly. To catch the ball, it goes up your sleeve, across your shoulders, down the side, under the cup. But be very careful. Don't put the little ball into the wrong pocket or you will have a confused ball. Yes. You can flick all night if your ball's confused, and you probably know that already. But what you do, you go flick, 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 and everybody claps. Why do they clap? Because when you flick, you've got an orange. <laughs> if you clap that, you'll go mad over the lemon. The lemon is... <laughs> At the heart of close-up magic is an astonishing piece of equipment, the human hand. Manual dexterity comes naturally to us, but some people have taken this ability to extraordinary lengths. All levels of close-up and stage all have different dexterities. I mean, there are people out there, I don't do this stuff, so forgive me, all those magicians watching, but there are people out there who do this stuff, you know? To do that well, I don't. That's very dexterous. To work with your hands and to, to do something that not everybody could do, and it required uh, 
five days, uh, five days a week and five hours a day of uh, standing in front of a mirror, practicing and practicing and practicing. All great magicians that I've ever known or met loves to practice. To make it look good, you should be fluent at it. You should be able to make it look easy no matter how hard it is. Once the first uh, mouth drops open in disbelief, because you as a 12-year-old have done something really quite amazing, uh, then the practice is worth it. No matter how amazing his skills, the magician failed to progress from a street performer for hundreds of years. Wherever crowds gathered, there he would compete with the melee of traders and other entertainers for a few coins. 500 or 600 years ago, all magicians were sort of uh, street performers working outdoors at the fairs, and working the street corners and buskers. Early magicians were called jugglers and came from the school of the jester and the fool. It comes from the French jonglers, which basically was an all-round term to de describe a speciality act. So a, a jongler would basically do magic, maybe a bit of juggling. Perhaps he would sell people stuff to cure an ill, or he would read a fortune. Plate spinning, contortions. You know, he was basically a performer of all sorts of, like, a, a, he was a one-man theatre company. And mostly they would perform in places like fairs and fates and stuff like that. But here's a guy who can suddenly make money appear from behind your ear, make gold coins appear from inside bread rolls and stuff like that. And it was amazing. This was a fantastic entertainment. He could do things that no-one else could do. One thing all magicians had to do, but which drew universal suspicion from their punters, was the ability to distract the eye, otherwise known as misdirection. Well, if I'm sitting here and suddenly... Well, of course, you looked at the box too, didn't you? Misdirection is a magician's most powerful weapon. The man who is, who is going to do the next part of the trick is this man. So what he would do is he would start to put it in and say, look, here it is in the back. Please feel it is in the back. Feel. Don't break, OK? Now, are you with this girl? No. And that was all he was necessary to do. <laughs> you see? <laughs> and now, <laughs> he's gone. Please feel inside the bag, all right? And uh, yes, any end, that doesn't matter. And you look inside the bag, all right? But in the audience, they too, they were wrong because the egg was in there all the time. It's more about directing attention so that at all times people feel like they're looking at the most important thing. If they realize that they've been misdirected, then it wasn't misdirection, it was just bad. Um, <laughs> misdirection is supposed to be something you're not aware of happening. You're not supposed to think, oh, I didn't see that, I was looking in the wrong place. Because then you know, because then you can work back and you can track it back and go, well, it must have been when he made me look over there that it happened. You know, what you want someone to do is come to the, get to the end of the trick and go, I don't get it. When could that possibly have happened? I was watching him the whole time. But of course they weren't watching the whole time. Or they were watching in the wrong place. These, the secrets of trickery, led to magicians being regarded as disreputable. Street magic was associated with sharp practices. Magic tricks could be used to cheat in street gambling. We still see bystanders being shafted at three-card Monte on street corners today. And misdirection is also the tool of another group of street hustlers, the pickpockets. The link between the pickpocket and the magician, of course, goes back to the market square, and there is that wonderful painting by Hieronymus Bosch of the cup and ball performer engaging a member of a small crowd in his magic at the same time as somebody sneaks up behind the spectator to pick the pocket. Misdirection and the sleight of hand that is so common in magic certainly has a parallel over in pickpocketing. There are many, many examples where one can practically say that it's the same technique both in the dexterity aspect, the coordination, timing, and certainly in misdirection. Today, when I perform, I really tell in advance that I am a pickpocket. 
And I do that because I find that regardless of how well informed they are, I can still do it. Have you ever heard of the word misdirection, diversion of attention that yeah. they use in I magic? What you're doing with me now. Magic, exactly, <laughs> diversion. Yes. I just wonder whether there was a difference between men and women. <laughs> okay, oh, okay. Yeah. Then I thank you. That was all. That was okay. easy, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, but sir, sir, come back a second. Uh, isn't the watch yours? <laughs> Yeah, no, yeah, <laughs> you know, if I, if I were you, if I were you, put put it in your pocket, because otherwise I may take it again. No, put it inside. No, 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 come on, put it, put it in your pocket. Sure. Where, where, where is not the key? The key. I took the key from you. Yeah, okay, put, okay, put okay, it back. Exactly. Put it back. No, 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 you get them. Okay. Put that back in your pocket. And if I take, you remember before you said I can't keep the card yeah. if I find it, right? Well, that's the whole idea. Thank okay, you so much for being part. Okay, yes. Thank you, guys. Yes. Okay. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Yeah. So now what about that? <laughs> Thank you. In the 18th century, close-up magic was still generally performed in the open. But one magician was beginning to find more lucrative ways of exploiting his talents. If there was one magician, perhaps, who really achieved a turnaround, it would have been a man called Isaac Fawkes, who actually made the egg bag famous. And he performed mainly in London, but he was actually famous worldwide, which is incredible for the time. Before then, you know, magicians had always performed in marketplaces, wherever they could kind of like, you know, scrape a groat together. But he actually hired out venues, he put up his own tent and did shows within the tent. So the kind of genius of it was that the kind of PR side, he got audiences to come to pay to see him, rather than taking his act to the audiences. And he's saying, come inside the tent and see this private show. It's just for you but you have to pay to come into the tent. So you're making a commitment beyond the sort of walking casually by. But people do. People come into the tent and they, they stand and watch the show. People credit him as being the sort of the first guy to come up with these ideas. Even though Isaac Fawkes was incredibly famous, uh, it sounds as though his repertoire wasn't that different. It wasn't as though he was particularly innovative. Uh, he did a lot of card tricks. Apparently he did a uh, trick where he took a pack of cards, threw it at the ceiling, and one card stuck there, and it was the chosen card. And amazingly, that is still one of the most popular close-up uh, commercial card tricks today. One of the most famous things about uh, is he's described as producing hundreds of eggs out of a bag. Which suggests that there was a bit of hype going on, because, you know, the egg bag has only ever got one egg involved. I mean, the story of him producing hundreds of eggs was obviously just a kind of like Chinese whispers kind of PR kind of thing to get people to see the show. It's just a cheap trick. Fawkes also hired tavern rooms in which to perform. He not only moves into a better locations, but he's also saying, I want to do less work. He starts putting together what I suppose you would call the birth of the variety show. He says, let's get some other people. He's very keen on what he calls posture makers, uh, basically contortionists. And that's great, so he gets to do his show, he's indoors, it's a lot more comfortable. But the problem with it is, you're in a tavern. People are drinking, people are having a wild time, they're perhaps not the most conducive to an audience. I often think that if people had a few drinks, that's great for magic, but if you have too many drinks, then you slip over the edge into being a yob. And also, it's kind of seedy. It's not really what he's looking for. He wants to move up a peg, he wants to get the better class of clientele, and they're not going to come to the tavern to watch him. So eventually he's taking over theatres, halls, places like that, and putting on bigger and better shows. He grew very rich out of it. I mean, really rich. For his day, he was a megastar. Even those that have the eyes of hawks cannot catch out your servant, Isaac Fawkes. By Fawkes' time, one of the close-up magician's main props was the playing card which by the 18th century, the printing press had made readily available. I called this the world's <sighs> fastest card trick. <laughs> Playing cards, of course, weren't invented until about 1371 in Spain and uh, in those days were hand-painted. So not exactly an obvious choice for the ordinary conjurer to be using until they became mass-marketed. This is 
53 different symbols that everybody recognizes in a very tight little container that slips into my pocket. There we go. Playing cards are fascinating. Fortunes have been won and lost. Loves have come and gone on the turn of a single card. There's a mystery and enchantment to playing cards in and of themselves. To be honest, the greatest thing about cards is that they're readily available to a young magician who, in his sort of early teens, wants to be able to do magic tricks. Um, everyone has a pack of cards at home, and so you can go and start learning tricks instantly without having to go and spend lots of money at magic shops. People can associate with them, and they know that what you're doing is actually based on your ability or your sleight of hand rather than on a trick prop. The playing cards became uh, an important tool uh, of magic um, in, in lots of sort of different routes. First of all, they were universally known, uh, worldwide uh, they were known, and they were known as a gambling device. This association with gambling made cards so disreputable that the church tried to ban them, and card magicians were often confused with card sharps and no identity was more obscure than that of the greatest card cheat of them all. The Expert at the Card Table was written in 1902 by a man called S.W. Erdnays. It's a unique book and is generally regarded to be one of the most important books on magic and also card cheating. As far as one can tell, no one has ever existed with the name Erdnays. It doesn't take much detective work to realise that if you read the name backwards, it spells out E.S. Andrews. So a lot of people have assumed that somebody by that name, or at least with the surname Andrews, was the author of this mysterious book. It's not surprising if you're writing a book that explains how you cheat at cards that you might want to keep your identity secret. There have been all sorts of theories about who this mysterious Mr Andrews was. One of the most prevalent theories is that he was a Mr Milton Franklin Andrews, who was around at the turn of the century, the early 1900s, who was well known as being a card cheat at the time. However, there have been a lot of other theories, and if I'm totally honest, I'm not entirely convinced when one looks more carefully at the evidence about Milton Franklin Andrews. The truth is that nobody actually knows who wrote the book, and it may well be that he never wanted anyone to find out who he was, and we'll never know. Erdnays in his book talks about dealing from the bottom of the pack and says that this is one of the most important moves that any card cheat needs to be able to master. Um, of course, the difficulty is that whenever the cards are cut, as they are in any game, then those cards that were on the bottom end up in the middle of the pack. And for that reason, people have worked out ways of dealing not from the bottom, but rather from the middle of the pack of cards. So just to show you what I mean, supposing one of those aces is in the middle of the pack, and uh, in fact, let's put another one of the aces in somewhere else as well. We could do this, in fact, well, let's do it with all of the aces like this. So they go in different parts of the pack like this. I hope that you can see that they really are uh, randomly spaced out in different parts of the middle of the pack. Um, it is, however, possible to control more or less where those go and to keep a, a fairly good idea of where they are, so that when the cards are dealt out, for instance, if there are five players, when I deal a card to myself, I'm actually not dealing a card from the top of the pack, um, I'm dealing a card from deep within the middle of the pack. So it's possible to do this uh, even with uh, one hand like this. Uh, you actually then deal to yourself uh, all four of those aces. Most of the card cheating that would have gone on, and that I'm sure does still go on, would happen in private games. Now, obviously, if you're going to control the card, you need to be able to control it even when the cards are shuffled. And there are lots of different ways by which cards are shuffled. Obviously, uh, people in casual games will sort of generally shuffle the cards in this sort of a manner. Um, sometimes you get people who do these slightly flashier shuffles like this, sort of a waterfall type of shuffle. Um, all of those are perfectly uh, acceptable in most games of cards. Um, of course, in a, in a casino or a more formal environment, uh, a dealer generally shuffles uh, like this. This is a, a more standard uh, on-the-table shuffle and a series of cuts. Uh, nevertheless, despite all this shuffling and cutting, uh, it's actually possible to keep track of where that card that we started off with is. So I've managed to keep the uh, Ace of Spades under my control throughout. Of course, as well as shuffling the cards, uh, when the cards run past, it's also possible to see some of the other cards as well. So it's then possible to put them into a particular order to rearrange those cards. Just to show you what I mean, if I stop that halfway through, you'll see here the way the cards 
are interwoven together. It's not a perfect shuffle, they don't alternate exactly, but they nevertheless are in a particular order. And the advantage of putting them in a particular order is it will enable me to keep control not only of the ace of spades that I've got here, but if I spread the cards out, also the two, three, four, five, in fact, all of the spades, all the hearts, all the clubs, and all of the diamonds, every one of those cards in perfect order. Both the card cheat and the honest magician require extreme dexterity. Something very hard to imagine in the case of the next magician to follow Fawkes as an international star. Another magician that was around roughly the same time as Isaac Fawkes uh, was a guy called Matthew Bouchinger, and he was kind of memorable as a magician for slightly uh, different reasons to Isaac Fawkes. The thing that stands out about Matthew is that he didn't have any arms and he didn't have any legs. And that kind of makes you stand out in a crowd. He was 29 inches high. According to records, he had what can best be described as flippers. And with it, he managed to be amazingly dexterous. Even though he didn't have fingers, he could do slight of hand magic. The kind of mind boggles. And he was great at drawing as well. He used to make these portraits made out of tiny letters. On one particular occasion, he spends 15 months drawing a picture in which he includes, I think it's the Lord's Prayer, in the hairstyle. I don't even know how that would work. I don't even know what kind of brain that would say that, here's a good idea, I'm going to draw someone, and in the curls of the hair, I shall insert the Lord's Prayer. As far as magic is concerned, he learns to do magic. He does coin tricks and card tricks, and very famously does the cups and balls trick. Like Fawkes, the little man performed in taverns and private parties. These enclosed spaces allowed magicians to control their environment. It is known that he had a bit of an entourage with him, so, you know, maybe you get this picture of him kind of sat on a table, all 29 inches of him, and lots of people underneath operating contraptions. Who knows? He produces not only balls, but he also produces uh, small hens, livestock from under his cups. It's very impressive. It wasn't just your standard freak. Uh, he actually got invited to perform at, uh, at sort of royal banquets, uh, noblemen's houses, and he is basically, you know, a toast of society. People are drawn to the strange and the unusual. Um... And I think that that was a big plus for Matthew. The little man was astonishing because even without hands, he still excelled at the other fundamental magician skill, sleight of hand. When you think about a magician, you think about him pulling a coin from behind the ear. Well, that's, you know, that's sleight of hand. A pretty basic thing would be to hide something in your hand. You take your hand and you hide something using the muscles to hold it in position in a non-obvious way. Bad magicians are really obvious because they sort of walk up to you and they go, hello, and they have their hands in this sort of weird position that makes you look like you've got sort of arthritis or something like that, and it's a strange, you know, trying to look natural. So the ability to hold sort of 20 cards in, an, in a hand and make them appear one by one is technically sleight of hand. It's things with everyday objects that uh, the magician himself makes happen. You take a rubber band just like this, and I'll break it, okay? And then you just put it back together like this. That's uh, organic magic, sleight of hand with uh, everyday objects. Take a hanky, you push it into your fist. It's the simplest trick in the world, and you go, well, hey, it changes into an egg, okay? Not good, but quick. Uh, now, what we've done is combine sleight of hand with something which is called a gimmick, or a fake, because it's not a real egg, OK? A fake is something that looks real, but it's not, and it's spelled F-E-K-E, -E, sort of magician's terminology. A gimmick is a kind of hidden bit of equipment that you don't see at all that helps you do the trick. And it's the combination of these things that does it. Now, I'll show you that again, because the other element you need to use is presentation, obviously, the whole showmanship thing. So I'll show you how this works. That goes in there. So when I pick up the hanky, what that is is a big move to cover the small move. OK, now, so that pushes in there, also you're showing that hand empty, also good psychologically. You push it inside the fist, but obviously into the egg, so you combine in slight hand with the fake, and then you show it's changed into an egg. Now, obviously, you keep the hole to the back, that's the important thing. Uh, that's actually a fake as well, because that whole explanation was kind of a gimmick to help me get away with this, which was misdirection, making you think it was a plastic egg, when in fact it's a real one. That's misdirection. Magic does remind us of things we're in danger of forgetting. 
uh, not only that the world is a mysterious place, but look, um, that, that life is full of surprises. Here, this is a folded piece of paper, and it's about, oh, I would say, half an inch, inch thick. And if I take the rubber band off, I can show you what it actually is, which is a bag, a paper bag. And uh, inside this folded, thin paper bag, we have what? Well, we have a glass of uh, liquid. In this case, uh, it is uh, iced coffee. Cheers. And so magic reminds us that life is full of surprises. And some magicians will go to any lengths to create a surprise. America's most celebrated dinner table magician of the early 20th century began his career as a close-up magician in the roughest bars of New York's Bowery. Now then, uh, the reason you're here is uh, you're going to see some magical effects because this guy we're talking about today is called Malini, Max Malini. Uh, pretty heavy. Paul pretty Daniels heavy. became and fascinated would, uh, by Max Malini when he discovered that Malini had innovated many of today's classic close-up tricks. Magic. Um, I decided to put together a show about Max Malini because if you're a keen magician and, and you're a keen historian and not just a trickaholic, what's the next trick? You will find Malini written about in glowing terms in, in these old magazines and books. If you want a picture of him in your mind, he looked a bit like Napoleon or Al Capone. And he was born in the late 1800s. He had a very guttural accent. He was from the Polish-Austrian border. And he, when he was four, his family moved to New York. And Max Malini's magic essentially was all close-up. And the reason it was all close-up was because he never did anywhere much bigger than this. It was mostly for the wealthy of the world. He would set up shows in the best hotels, and he would just travel the world, and I mean the world. He go chink 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 chink, and one of them would jump from here to over there, and then <laughs> well, just when you thought what, he'd go chink 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 and it would jump from here to there. <laughs> you just get the idea now, yes? So it would go, ching 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 and it would jump from here to there. <laughs> it's, it's fascinating, isn't it? It was extraordinary to me to find the things that he did that I just took for granted, that he'd started. Watching here, ching 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 You're looking in the wrong place. It's over here. <laughs> and then, and then, then ching 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 and they would all be over there, and that would be ching ching by... Max Malini. <laughs> Malini, he was famous for a thing called the colour change, amongst many other things. But the colour change didn't necessarily mean the card changed colour. His hands would bounce like this across it, like that, and he would change to a different card, all right? But I, I couldn't figure that out, because Max couldn't have done that. Because his hands were so small, they were only this big, size 5 glove, I don't think he used that method or the one that came out in 1905 where he said, look at that card with four of spades, it would change to the eight of clubs, and his hands would still be empty. If he'd been around in the 1970s, which he wasn't, when a fellow came along called Paul Daniels and came up with that one, which is very clean and leaves absolutely nothing anywhere. I, I don't think he could have done that because of the size of his hands. So the only thing that I, in my research, was able to come up with was there was a Dutchman around at the time called Okito, and he would do this, and it was a kind of pchum, and the card would change, and Malini must have done that one, I think, because the only one his hands would fit, but we'll never know. One of the most interesting things uh, about magic is that people seem to fail to realise about preparation. People assume that everything you do is on the spur of the moment. There's a hell of a lot more work goes into the preparation of a, a split-second effect than, I, than meets the eye. Malini was the sort of... That was his whole being, that he would spend hours and day, perhaps even months or years preparing for a trick. Malini's wealthy patrons invited him to fashionable dinners where he sat amongst the guests and performed amazing tricks, some of which were to become legendary. 
Now, there's a story about Max Molina going to an exclusive dinner party, probably in a stately home, or, you know, they sat there in the ballroom. You can imagine everybody sat around the table, all expectantly waiting for the uh, the main course. And meanwhile, he's doing a few tricks and just being his normal self. And he somehow managed to steer the conversation around to the fact that he was able to raise the dead. And that he will prove it. Because, of course, as soon as they challenge him and say, well, that's nonsense, he says, I'll prove it! And uh, basically, the main course arrived, and you imagine with big silver cloche, they lift that off the table, and there's this beautiful turkey. Some people say a goose, but it was definitely a turkey. And he takes the knife, makes his, his sort of manoeuvres over this goose, prods it, and the goose comes back to life. Runs round the table, everybody's screaming, the place in disarray, and clears off. And what he had done was he had taken a live goose and plucked it tucked its head under its wing, you know, you can hypnotise birds relatively easily, strangely, and put that on the table. So, you know, whether that actually was true or not is kind of irrelevant. Molini was just that sort of guy where stories like that abounded about him because he was such a character. Max Molini, short, not as good-looking as me, you know, and stuff like that. The biggest question in his show was the trick you're about to see, OK? What he used to use as a hat... And to be honest, to show the detail I've gone to for you, I have used an Austrian hat, for real, OK? And he used to use a coin, all right? That's it. Now, what you've got to do is, first of all, your name's Lindsay, isn't it? Lindsay, go in the hat, look around, make sure there's no more coins in the hat. You can pull out the brim. You can do what you like with it, but, you know, you've got to get it right. All right? Have you done that? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. OK, I'll have the hat. You make sure that that is not a double-headed coin. In other words, it's just a normal coin. Yeah? yeah. Happy. Normal yeah? Coin. Normal coin. Now, what I'm going to do is this. Can I check that? I'm going to spin it. Right. Heads or tails? Tails. Pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a block of ice, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> By the time Molini was performing hat tricks at exclusive parties, the hoi polloi could get their magic fix for a few pennies or a few cents. For by the middle of the 19th century, Fawkes's multi-act sideshows had evolved into the music hall or vaudeville in the USA. Magicians would perform short routines in theatres alongside singers, acrobats and performing dogs. Magicians toured from music hall to music hall, honing an act which didn't change in years. This was the birth of the modern magic routine. One of the most subtle presenters of such a routine was Richard Pitchford. Better known by his stage name, Cardini, he performed his delicate and complex act wearing gloves. Cardini's act is just layered and layered and layered with, with surprises. <laughs> he portrayed a slightly inebriated English gentleman beginning to make his way home from a rather happy night out in his club. Cardini was just a brilliant actor. There was a subtext going on in his mind. Uh, you can see as he's performing that he's surprised by all this wonderful stuff going on, and he gets annoyed by it. You see, he didn't just produce playing cards. They suddenly appeared in his hands, and he'd throw them away, and they would still be there. No sooner had he thrown the cards away than he'd find a cigarette in one hand and a cigarette in another, and if he placed the first cigarette in his mouth, then there'd be a third cigarette. <laughs> Where were all these cigarettes coming from? He was a man in total confusion.
Cardini was, probably of all of us, I think Cardini was the greatest technician. He was born in Mumbles, just outside Swansea. Got caught up at a very young age in the maelstrom of the First World War. Was twice injured in the trenches. It was during that period that the pack of cards which every soldier was allowed to carry became his sanity. He knew a little bit about magic and he started to develop manipulation in the trenches. Uh, so cold it was, he asked for gloves to wear while he was performing his manipulations, which enabled him to develop the greatest sensitivity that one could possibly imagine. Cardini combined brilliant technical skill with a unique stage persona that delighted his audience. Magicians refer to this as patter, even when not a word is spoken. The patter infills the ground. It's the music of close-up. Second one, second look, boom, sell, boble, un, deux, trois, one, two, and one, three, one down, one up. Brrrr, gali gali, up the two down, c'est l'opé, tous les deux en bas, oui. I'm more concerned with the personality than the magic itself. I think magic is about a magician, not about tricks or not about effects. But the, the, the idea of the trick is this. Here's the glass, here's the bottle. Here's the bottle, here's the glass. The, the and sometimes the, glass, the patter is more important than the magic. <laughs> they have now changed places. Tommy Cooper used to take the mickey out of it. Something terrible, didn't he? You know, and then uh, cover a ball, a ball cup. People say about people like Les Dawson, hey, to play the piano, that bad, he must be a good pianist. <laughs> well, no, he wasn't. And like Tommy, he, he must have been a great magician to do that. Well, he wasn't. He was a competent, average, magic club magician. He was the greatest clown on earth at the time. In complete contrast to Tommy Cooper's endearing comic incompetent, Channing Pollock's stage persona was sexy and sophisticated. In tune with the New York 1950s cabaret settings, he was booked to appear in. I'd purchased a, a dove. It was way back in 1947 or 48. I meant to buy a rabbit, but I ended up buying a dove. And... Uh, there was something about that prop that was more alive and animated than a, a playing card or uh, other objects. The act was just so simple and direct, and there was no futzing around. I mean, he just came out and just started doing real magic. What I managed to do was incorporate the working with these doves along with the manipulation. It didn't require any words. It was uh, self-evident and uh, all visual. He wasn't a demonstrative performer. He seemed sort of, you know, detached on stage. There was a dark romanticism to his magic. The use of the dove, the symbolism of the dove. The blood red silk handkerchiefs, which were a motif throughout the act. But he also had this sort of aura about him, this very mysterious aura I don't think he was trying to be mysterious. I think he was just being himself. He just had some sort of magical quality. I developed a certain aloofness on stage. Uh, some people might call it sophistication, but uh, it really came about out of sheer fright. 
I was kind of frightened uh, when I first went to New York to appear in cabaret, and I developed this attitude. <laughs> it seemed to be the. <laughs> it seemed to work. My goal when I started was I wanted to be Channing Pollock. I wanted to do uh, magic with the doves, so he was a, an idol of mine. Nowadays, Lance Burton is one of the highest paid stage magicians in the world, with his own Las Vegas theater and a street in the city named after him. And you know, my goal is the same today. I look at Channing today. And I go, that's what I want to be when I get to that age, because he's just still the coolest guy uh, in the world. Today, the Lance Burton Show in Las Vegas is booked up for years to come. But other close-up magic performers have found their natural home in television, the entertainment revolution of the 20th century. TV killed off the dying embers of vaudeville and music hall, but provided a whole new platform for magicians, or for those who could adapt to it. This is a very quick one with a, with a handkerchief, with Savannah's handkerchief. You twist it into a, a sort of a rope like this. Have you ever tried to tie a knot in this, Savannah? Do you tie a knot in it? It just doesn't, you see. You tie it like that and you pull it, and it, it's a sort of knot that isn't... People David Nixon was the first famous British magician on TV, so he's a huge influence on people like myself and Paul Daniels and all the rest of them. And what was... I mean, I suppose the one word that springs to mind is charm. He was a charming man. He was your, like, your, your nice uncle who did, uh, you know, tricks at a wedding reception. And uh, what was nice about him, he kind of, like... He'd been a cabaret magician. There's this whole period where close-up kind of married together with stage magic and theatre magic, so you were doing small-scale tricks with everyday objects, but on a stage. And he kind of brought that to TV, so he used the TV medium much in the way that he'd use a cabaret room. Lady Doctor, may I please borrow your wrist for a moment? Your left wrist, perhaps? May I? You don't mind? Thank you very much indeed. I'll be very careful of that. <laughs> David Nixon's genteel presentation and intimate close-up magic was ideal for the times. All the family could safely gather and watch. Circulation, well, that's not too tight, is it? Would you be kind enough just to hold my hand? This is the best part of the trick. The idea is to try <coughs> and pull the handkerchief through your wrist without undoing the knot and without actually severing the hand from the body, you see. Now, are you ready? Ready? That's it. That's all there is to it. <laughs> Close-up magic perpetuated its image as safe, polite entertainment for more than 30 You're years. Me, I know. OK, now, you can tie another one at the top. I don't care. You can tie another one. Just to make sure, no? To be sure. Good? Oh, boy. Now, how many knots you can't hear now? It's two. Two? Two, yes. Well, anyway, you hold this in the hand. He doesn't believe it. I really <laughs> don't feel it. But by ignoring the changing times, close-up magic had become dull and younger audiences lost interest. Close-up magic wasn't working as well as it could have on... Uh, television, that, you know, anybody that performs in the real world and sees the reactions that this gets in the real world can understand that what was being done on television at the time wasn't duplicating those responses. In fact, it might be said that it's only recently with David Blaine that uh, the public themselves have started to talk about the medium of close-up. Any card that you want, you can have, right? It's fair to say? Here we go, watch. Take one out. Take one. Don't let me see it. Which one? That special moment show of the magic them, being done them. before your very eyes. Here, take the deck. Mix it into the deck. Mix it up into the deck. We still carry a, a huge memory of how wonderful David Blaine is at Street Magic. On the other side of the glass. <laughs> Give me a quarter. I got a quarter right here. You know how people change the consistency of metals? No. What? How people change what? Consistency. Like if you squeeze something, if you squeeze a piece of metal, it heats up. That's obvious. Yeah. Well, look, watch. What happened with David Blaine was, for the first time, someone was shooting over his shoulder and not necessarily getting the trick, but getting the audience reaction. Mm. 
you are listening to that audience react and going, you can't act that. You can't act that reaction. What? What? Look. <laughs> Therefore, it must be genuine. Therefore, what we were seeing on screen must be real. <laughs> okay, now wait. First of all, <laughs> the first one that was in my mind, he really guessed that was real. I think he's not natural. What he did was shoot it in a almost music TV style. It was that kind of one wobbly handheld camera, which you know, gave it that real sort of urban feel. What Blaine also did was to rediscover close-up magic as an opportunistic event, finding its audiences casually in the street, the marketplace, or the London Eye. I'm not good with heights myself. Some would say they're not good with heights before. And the, the other thing about it is I get that sinus thing, not just ears popping, but, you know, you get that little shooting pain. And you can't smoke on here. So I've come up with this kind of combined sort of internal nicotine patch with nasal floss. All right, check it out. Like, uh... oh. <laughs> I think what's happened on TV with magic the past few years is that focus on people's reactions. That's the real important thing. And it is the joy of doing magic. You know, the reason I do magic is to see someone's jaw drop and they go, wow. And it's that relationship between a live audience and the magician that's at the very heart of close up magic, no matter where it's performed. Just as it was in Max Molini's era. Close-up magic today is alive and well. Right, it's cabaret time. Close-up magic consists of walking up to a table of ten people who have just had dinner and entertaining them for five minutes. And it doesn't consist of you walking up to the table with a pack of cards and showing them how clever you are. Ooh. Well, one of the lines I use a lot when I arrive at a table is, good evening, everybody. My job to entertain you for two minutes. It will seem longer. I'm going to do some comedy impressions for you. And then I ask them for a match or a lighter and set fire to a napkin. Guess who this is? <laughs> Statue Lee. was quick. Second impression. Joan of Arc. Someone has turned up at the table and is doing something slightly unusual. And they're going to want to know what the payoff is. Within seconds, the fire's been put out, the napkin's back together, and they're going... Oh, how did that happen? Now I've got them. They're mine. Would you like me to explain how I did it? Yeah, then it becomes a seminar and you get the tax back on the whole night out. <laughs> I do not like the middle. I like the corner. Oh, right. See? And then you're so busy looking at the middle, you don't see one of the corners is burnt. One of the corners is burnt. Yeah, but that's the bit, that's the bit I don't understand. <laughs> you can play two cards when you turn up at a table. Aren't I clever? Now, the other side of the aren't I clever card is aren't you stupid? And in this, especially in this country, in England. Now, nobody in this country wants to go out and to be made to look stupid for half an hour, especially in front of their top clients. They don't. But if you turn up at the table and you go, well, I'm not honestly sure how that happened, <laughs> but let's see if it'll happen again, then we're all on a similar level with each other. We'll light a corner. Don't take your eyes off the corner. That's when it happens. Focus as much as you can. Now, this time, you're so busy looking at the corner, you might not see the middle isn't there anymore. It is so immediate. There isn't any room between you and the audience for anything underhand to take place, even on a subconscious level. Can you hear me? <laughs> Can you still hear me? Right, no. Is that fair? Is that fair? No, good, excellent. Oh. <laughs> Here, take this pack. Give them a shuffle. A man sharing my fantasy. <laughs> Did you see his eyes light up? Look at the nose. That's enough. That's enough. Don't wear them out. They cost money. Look at the top card. Don't pick the ace of spades. Place your card, which is not the ace of spades, face up back in the pack. Give him another shuffle. <laughs> Can I have them back? Can I have them back? Thank you. Oh. <laughs> When you see it on TV, it looks so fake, but then just seeing it there in front of your eyes, you know, you just can't believe it, and then you think, oh my god, all that crap you see on TV is actually true. Today, close up is the fashionable face of magic. It's reached deep into popular culture with new magicians, new audiences, new venues. 
I think Close Up Magic will be around forever. I mean, partly because it's one of those geek hobbies. You know, when the internet crashes, people will still be fiddling with a pack of cards in the bedroom, you know. But the essence of Close Up Magic stays unchanged. This is a pound coin, that's all it is. It's a, a small pound coin. And, I, and, and if I throw it like this, you can see it going from hand to hand, all right? Now, if you do this, as I say, they'll probably think, well, that's a funny old coin. But any coin, you take it like that and you say to them, now look at that, that is gone. It will be as startling in the future as it will in the past. Inside its sealed capsule on the London Eye, Paul Zenon's audience is about to witness a close-up trick, but on a very surprising scale. Card tricks. Intrinsically very, very boring. However, this one is no exception. What's your name? Fiona. Fiona. OK, the thing is, Fiona, when it, I get you to choose a card, right, it's important yeah. that you realise it is just a regular pack of cards, not a trick pack. Okay. So examine them very, very closely. <laughs> OK, now, also the other thing is, when you choose a card, particularly from a magician, it can make one card look more sexy than the others, right? Sexy. Ooh, choose me! OK, now, don't do that. I'll tell you what, just think of a card instead of choosing one from the pack. Everybody try this, just the first card that comes into your head, OK? But not the Ace of Spades. All right, because too many people, it's too obvious, you're too easy if you choose that. So instead, I'll flick through, just think of one of those. Was that too quick? Did you get one? I'll do it again. You yeah. got one? No, yeah. Cool. Check this glass. <laughs> Solid. Check it there. What I'm going to do, you've just thought of a playing card. Hopefully, if this works, your card is going to end up on the other side of the glass. Wow. Now, that might sound like familiar. You might think you've seen this trick before, but this is a bit different. It's not the one that all those amateur American magicians do. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so just concentrate <laughs> on your card. OK, right. other side of the glass. Here we go. Three, two, one. Is that, is that tough and glass? <laughs> out, well, out of it, what, what card were you thinking of? Queen of Hearts. Queen of Hearts? Anybody else think of the Queen of Hearts just out of interest? No. Yeah? <laughs> oh, well, you're speaking for everyone now. <laughs> but you just thought of the Queen of Hearts. Now, that's interesting, because when I said the other side of the glass, I didn't just mean just the other side of the glass. I meant way over the other oh side of the glass, God. on that boat, oh on the river, <laughs> down there. <laughs> Oh, was that the card you were thinking of? <laughs> Give her a wave. Three days we've been up here, 37 boats, and finally someone picks the right card. Thank you. As close-up magic enters the 21st century, there is little to indicate that it will ever change much or ever die away. It might fade into the background for a while, but it always comes back in the end, because human beings will never lose their joy in being surprised and delighted in front of their very eyes. I mean, if you have a choice between seeing the biggest magician in the world at the big stadium for the biggest ticket price you've ever paid at perfect seats, and you have a chance between seeing one of the, what I would consider, 10 best close-up people in a room, just go with the close-up person. The History of Magic continues next Saturday at the earlier time of 8 o'clock with The Disappearing Act. Next on BBC2, exploring the age of carnival in Venice. <laughs>